On today's World Inside, the Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao wraps up his trip to the U.S. to meet the U.S. Trade Representative and Commerce Secretary. Can China-U.S. trade talks lead to a stall in bilateral relations? Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Trade ministers from the APEC economies wrap up their meeting in Detroit. Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao met with U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai in Detroit, having previously met U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo in Washington. These meetings follow the G7 summit in Hiroshima, where Biden and other leaders said that de-risking and not decoupling was the new trade strategy towards China. What do we make of the U.S. new trade policy toward China if it is really new? Have the recent cabinet-level meetings between Chinese and American delegations lead to a thaw in bilateral ties? And what's likely to be the impact on the economies in the Asia-Pacific region? Let's ask our panelists. For the discussion on the APEC Trade Ministers' meeting in Portland, U.S., Yan Liang, the Endowed Chair of Economics at the Willem Net University in Jakarta, Dr. Ibrahim Rahman, he's a Senior Research Associate at Indonesian Financial Group Progress. In Shanghai, Joseph Gregory Mahoney, Professor of Politics with East China Normal University. In Beijing, Chu Qiang, Research Fellow of the Global Issues at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Now, Asia-Pacific region has always been regarded as a growth engine for the world's economy. When the trade ministers were talking to one another, what are some of the central points you are getting in terms of the prospect of the economy? Uh, Mr. Chu, briefly. Well, I think uh, the basic message and I think the basic tone for the meeting is good. I think a lot of uh, things, hostility is thawing. And I think uh, everybody are showing good intention to meet with each other because as the representative Tai has mentioned, China and America are very important uh, you know, partners in the world trade. We together are holding up to a large part of the world economy, which okay. uh, I quote, many other countries are living up to. So mm. I think if this is the time we're facing potential recession, we, are, we should work together. Dr. Rahman, we understand last year, the growth of Asia Pacific is uh, very mild due to the pandemic, of course. This year likely to be 3.4%, um, but it's not as optimistic as earlier thought. Your take. Yeah, um, talking about APEC, is, we are talking about 21% of Asia Pacific economies. Uh, they are occupying about 60% of the global GDP. So the dynamic in the region will be, will be very, very strong. Uh, we probably can neglect what's happening during the last two years uh, due to the pandemic, but we realize that APEC is always engine for growth for the region and beyond. As we see in uh, 2021, APEC FDI has been as much as about 70% of the global FDI. And this proportion yeah. is quite similar uh, with regards to trade that we are probably about 55% of the global trade. So we are talking about region which is very rich and uh, potentially will contribute further for global economic growth in the next uh, couple of decades due to strong demand mm -hmm. and strong economic activities in the, in the region. Mm. Ms. Liang, trade conflicts of course existed in this region, uh, especially the two uh, trading powers like China and the United States. We understand that both sides have raised concerns with one another uh, and describe the discussion as frank, professional, constructive. Having said that, though, there were a lot of different opinions between the two sides uh, during the discussion. So your take about how is likely the impact of this discussion for future consensus uh, of discussion uh, among the trade ministers, at least. 
at these minister level, these kinds of dialogues and conversations are super helpful. Um, but at the same time, I think still to a great extent, the two sides are talking past each other. I think, you know, as uh, the trade representative, uh, Ms. Tai talked about that, you know, the region is facing with fragile supply chain and worsening climate crises and the growing inequality. And therefore these countries have to work together. And yet at the same yeah. time, we have all understand, right? The United States has basically waged the tech war, the trade war against China. Their literate, the, the narrative now has gone down, uh, rhetoric has gone down um, from decoupling to now de-risking. But still, I think there's a lot of political barriers that prevent the US to adopt a leadership role and effective framework mm. Um, to try to you know uh, promote the kinds of free trade and investment initiatives in this region to really promote common good. Okay, uh, Professor Mahoney, since you are more working on the geopolitical side, we noticed that uh, the ministers have all agreed that we are facing a tremendous uh, multi crisis, multiple crisis, and therefore need to think. Even I quote from the trade rep of the U.S. Uh, Ms. Tai as saying creatively. Now, how much momentum will that provide uh, for both the largest trading powers of the region and also the other economies in the region? After all, we see Indonesia, India, and many of the other uh, trading powers like uh, Japan, South Korea, all in the region. So what kind of momentum could this provide when we are facing crisis altogether? You know, it's, it's an interesting question because there's a lot to balance. And, and I think the, the immediate context is the G7 meeting. Uh, I will disagree with my colleague. I think de-risking is a, is a, a concept that poses a, a greater challenges than decoupling. I think decoupling was always uh, sort of this uh, this idea that, that seemed uh, impractical, that seemed um, very dangerous. Um, but de-risking is, is not really about risk management. It's about removing any sort of risk. And in the, in the increasing uh, era of, of securitization and polarization, uh, I think uh, de-risking uh, uh, looks like uh, something that is pragmatic and practical, but is actually um, uh, more concretely uh, aiming towards the sort of goals and objectives associated with decoupling, which I, I think is still uh, um, uh, what the U.S. is, is aiming for. About China and the U.S., uh, this time the trade, the trade ministers, commerce ministers met. Commerce ministers also met with the trade rep. And we saw discussions going on. Both sides have very similar um, readouts. That's a rare uh, phenomenon, shall we say, over the past three years. And we also see this is the first, quote unquote, cabinet level, ministerial level, face-to-face uh, -face meeting. Uh, for really quite some time. And we also noticed this is the front of trade rather than diplomacy, uh, which of course didn't come into being as a result of the so-called balloon incident earlier. So what does all of this mixed message mean uh, for the future direction of discussion between China and the United States? Uh, Ms. Liang. Right. So I think on the one hand, um, the United States clearly sees that, you know, China is such an important country, uh, important economy in the world. So the whole idea of wholesale decoupling is not going to be realistic, right? When you look at the trade war, since the starting of the trade war, the U.S.-China trade only increased, not decreasing. Last year reached a peak, you know, of $690 billion trade between the two countries. So at least in the rhetoric, taking at the face value, the United States understands that decoupling it's not going to work. Um, and that would also, you know, in some ways put the United States at a disadvantage in terms of its economy and its economic leadership in the global economy. So that's, that's why they're not talking about de-risking. But I totally agree without very clear guidance and definition of what those risks mean. So I think there's a lot of great zone, but at least I think from the United States perspective, I think they're seeing this as a gesture to try to thaw the the, the cold sort of uh, relationships between the two countries, which I think yeah. um, that would be a right move on their part, given that their economy is struggling and their political system is pretty much defunct. Um, they just reached the deal, the so-called final deal on the, the sort of debt ceiling, but that still needs yeah. to be voted. Um, and so I think, you know, given the reality of the world that we lived in, um, the United States needs to work on and trying to find a common interest and, you know, um, to work with China. Mm. Uh, do you agree with that, Dr. Rahman, that 
earlier rhetorics have to be walked back when you look at the reality. And it seems that politicians on both sides and uh, multiple sides seem to have come to realization of that somewhat. Right. Uh, I may be looking into a trade perspective uh, at this point. Sure. That, uh, the impact of trade wars during the U.S. and China was, in fact, creating, um, you know, um, loss loss solution for each for each country. A particular a study has mentioned that the impact is about 0 0.4 0 0.5 drop in its GDP. And looking into the perspective that China and the U.S. is always the center of gravity in the global economy, particularly in Indonesia, for instance, our exports are predominantly for the US and China. And this, this will create a lot of backward impact in other developing countries where we are depending on China as both importer and exporters of, of our product. At the same time in 2020, 2021, have learned the greater impact of, of the COVID pandemic, which is impacting the whole global supply chains. Yeah, price of, uh, of, of um, a trade has increased due to limitation of uh, vessel operation, which is then impacting the whole trade activity. So I think um, having said that both countries realize the importance of uh, coherent policies and yeah. you know hand in hand talking about uh, uh, situations, the impact is not only for the US and the China, but for surrounding countries, depending on those two countries. So for us, Absolutely. for me in Indonesia, I see this as good, good initiative you know, uh, despite all the globalization initiative happening in all across the countries, China and the US try to solve the solution, which might impact other countries as well. Given the messages being raised by both sides, and given the fact that during the G7 summit, the so-called economic coercion has been repeated once and again as rhetorics against China, uh, how do you see the next steps of discussion, if there were next step, uh, about trade and investment is likely to be. I believe uh, economy actually decides people's behavior and people's mindset. This is the first thing. And second, mm -hmm. if you take a look at the bigger picture of China and the U.S. trade and economy is actually still very complementary to each other. China has their part to do in the whole world, the USA as well. And uh, well, basically, according to the declaration and the actions of American government, they are saying goodbye to the new liberalism in the economy for sure. And take a look at uh, when we're talking about the coercion, the word, if you take a look at who is bleeding out when this really coercion is happening, I believe it's the alliance of the USA, for example, South Korea and uh, Japan, and also take a look at the uh, semiconductor industry in Taiwan province. You see, yeah. they're bleeding out the jobs and everything. But also if I take a look at China, and China is actually, you know, uh, giving a lot of the market and market shares and also production capacities to, you know, ASEAN countries, for example, in Vietnam and also in Africa. So we're feeling the blanks that's been draining out by USA. So I don't know what kind of action is really caught coercion, but according to the definition of the Wikipedia, I believe America is doing the coercion right now. But either way, I think this is a natural reaction when the two economies, the largest economies in the whole world, with facing the recession, they're trying to, you know, doing the best for their own interest. And uh, I think uh, in this is come the circle, everything is going to tighten up for sure. But also, right. let me please remind everyone, the economy cycle is going to, you know, reverse probably in five years or in a 10 years. And by that time, you're going to see a new round of the change of the behavior. Let me go to uh, Dr. Rahman. You know, for economies elsewhere uh, in the Asia Pacific region, there are so many possibilities that could happen to the two biggest trading powers, China and the United States, happening between the two. Um, so, what is the best option for the other economies, such as a very strong economy like Indonesia? Tell me more about your thoughts on, on these possibilities. Thank you very much. We, we always reach about 5% GDP growth, even during the pandemic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, looking into the, 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 the fight between, you know, a giant elephant and lion, we are, you know, in surrounding area where we are trying to benefit, you know, any impact from the, from the uh, dynamic between China and the U.S. 
As for now, I think the country is enjoying what China has been established as part of uh, Belt and Road Initiatives. Uh, we are soon enjoying the super fast train. Uh, yeah. Usually we just uh, look into what's happening in Europe or in Japan, Shinkansen. In the very soon, we'll be enjoying what is called a super fast um, a train developed by China connecting Jakarta and Bandung. And then we're also uh, going into the you know, the, the backward uh, strategy of uh, nickel production is also with China. So, so in, in the sense, um, we are isolating ourselves with the conflict. And I think uh, countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, we are just trying to get the benefit out of the debacle between those two countries, try to increase what can be improved in our economic uh, performance. We are usually very much depending on commodity boom and commodity price. And now yes. with the collaboration of China, we try to increase our capacity as nickel producer, which can be used as part of EV for you know electric car in the future. So transforming the country from uh, from the stage of developing countries towards trying to be you know more emerging countries. Yeah, uh, Miss Liang, um, some say this region Asia Pacific it's only at the very beginning of a new, um, shall I say, start. Uh, others say, well, there are too many unpredictable uh, factors moving around. So what is your take about this? Right. So I definitely think this region is very dynamic and it's very innovative and countries are all, you know, complementary in many sort of supply chain um, uh, segments. And so they're all trying to, you know, promote their infrastructure, to promote their uh, technical capacity and to upgrade their um, industries. I think, you know, many examples, um, you know, Vietnam, China, the United States, of course, these are very much sort of innovative countries. And so I think that the key here is to really trying to build a cooperation between all these countries and, you know, um, make sure that they all, you know, trying to provide technical assistance and capacity building activities in this region, rather than, you know, trying to create a kind of blocks and trying to um, so-called, you know, uh, in the name of building, you know, resilient supply chain to exclude uh, some countries from that supply chain. So I think, yeah. you know, again, going back to Catherine Tai's uh, message, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, conflicting uh, messages, especially, you know, between the words and actions, right? When you think about, you know, fragile supply chain, how can you exclude China from building that so resilient supply chain. When you think about the climate crises, how can you exclude China when you're trying to build green infrastructure, both domestically, but also abroad, you know, in barrel initiatives and also AIB and, you know, BRICS, um, all these countries' efforts to, you know, materialize the green transition and also growing inequality, right. right? When you have tariffs, that are imposing, you know, much, much more disproportionately large burden on the poor. So I think all of these are, you know, on the one hand, in words, they care about all these objectives. But then in reality, I think the actions are actually pointing towards the opposite direction. We have seen, you know, uh, uh, the uh, RCEP has been operating extremely successfully. Of course, it's quite a basic trade arrangement, but it's still it's a, a, fresh, a breath of fresh air during the most difficult pandemic years uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, also, we also saw the U.S. Uh, trying to advocate what they called as Indo-Pacific economic framework, uh, which China objected as not inclusive, uh, because even during the discussions on the sidelines of the APEC trade ministers this time, it did not include China into this uh, discussion on the basis of uh, the Indo-Pacific economic framework. How do we see these different ideas? Well, you know, we, we go back to uh, Trump uh, many years ago, blowing up the TPP um, and then the RCEP rising in the, in the ashes of that. Um, uh, you know, so where originally the U.S. was trying to build a trade group that would exclude China. And then later, Asia put together a, a trade group that uh, the United States didn't want to join. Um, I think that uh, uh, when we look at, um, there is this considerable overlap. We are, obviously, there's this huge uh, massive bilateral trade between both countries, uh, and both countries' economies are still very much dependent on this. Um, but, you know, we have to look at the other developments, right, in so much as we can see now that um, uh, various countries in Asia, certainly ASEAN countries, uh, both independently, um, uh, as, as uh, President Wokoto in Indonesia um, uh, was proposing uh, that um, 
that uh, uh, certain transactions involving MasterCard and Visa should should uh, be de-emphasized de in order to reduce exposure to uh, 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 politically economic risks uh, that uh, the world has seen rising in the uh -huh. wake of uh, U.S. sanctions against Russia uh, following the incident in Ukraine. Um, so there, the, and, and we see like this increasing trend of, of de-dollarization uh, through things like. Uh, um, um, uh, not only ASEAN, but uh, BRICS, uh, the possibility of a new currency emerging from the NDB. So there, there is this sort of double movement or, or triple movement. On the one hand, this, this historic level of bilateral trade, but also these rising uh, uh, trade groups that are exclusive, uh, um, as well as uh, these, uh, what, what some people call mini lateralism, uh, the, these smaller yes. uh, groups that are uh, creating new opportunities for doing business in ways that uh, try to avoid uh, the conflict uh, between uh, uh, the United States and China, as, as we see with ASEAN. Mm. I miss Liang. Well, I think definitely we see the trend of regional you know, trade agreements uh, with like-minded countries. But again, China's position has been always, you know, we wanted to create women cooperation. We don't want to exclude anyone. Uh, but I think, of course, it's the United States that is deliberately excluding China in some of the initiatives. That said, I think you know what the United States has been really doing, including at the G7, is there are a lot of loud political uh, narratives and rhetorics, but there's really very little substance in terms of their economic initiatives and policies. Take IPAD, uh, IPAF as, as example. It mm -hmm. is not a trade agreement. It does not prevent market assets to many of these countries that wanted to include increase the market assets. Um, you know, there's a lot of the talks about digital. Uh, infrastructure, digital rules, and also uh, labor rights. Um, but again, none of this is really at a substance level that would improve the economic opportunities uh, for the participating countries. So I think, you know, many countries share the kinds of, not necessarily frust frustration, but definitely uh, dissatisfaction, right, with how far the economic uh, arrangements uh, under the U.S.'s leadership can go. So I think that's why um, you know, China has been really working on the economic front and trying to forge that you know, win-win economic cooperation uh, with the global south. And so I think that really you know, um, gives China a lot of voice and leadership role um, in, in arranging all these you know, economic relationships. And so, I yeah, I think you know, a lot of the, these political barriers right, and political compromises are really undermining the US's leadership in terms of its economic leadership. Right, in this region. And without the economic leadership, I think um, all the other areas of leadership will be uh, very much undermined. Dr. Rahman. Yeah, I think um, as small and small country in ASEAN and in Asia, even though we are the largest in ASEAN countries, you always see that um, balanced position and better cooperation between China and the US will always give greater potential impact for, for, the, for the region. Uh, we are sharing the same commonalities that Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand are usually importing a lot from China as to support our uh, manufacturing industries. So stability in both countries, both in the US and, and China will lead us for, for a better economy, knowing that each countries are currently fighting towards possible recession towards the end of 2023. So if we put aside uh, the vehicle, including, uh, you know, well, misunderstanding or policy behind the decision made by uh, big countries like China and US, basically we are, we are fighting towards the same problem by the end of this year, which is economic recession. So without any clear cooperation between uh, China, US and APEC in general, we may lose the opportunity to increase our potential as the largest uh, trading bloc in the world. So that, that will be uh, one thing that uh, global leaders should understand, uh, should, should understand and put the yeah. priority upon other things. Uh Go to you, uh, Mr. Chu, also on the same question. We see so many different arrangements. Uh, talk about the arrangements as well. Uh, so to you, how will this discussion uh, eventually uh, having its impact on the relations uh, among the players in the region? Well, I think basically we need more of things like the RCDP and, uh, you know, more inclusive and uh, with a freer trade conditions among all the trading partners. Uh, that will boost the efficiency and benefit all the consumers, uh, eventually raise up the whole efficiency of the whole world. It's going to be for sure. So we should, you know, basically respect the, the rules of economics and trade and less okay. uh, interference from the politics. 
And this, I think, working together with this kind of willingness, the best uh, remedy for uh, the current backdrop we're facing as the whole world, as a whole human being. All right. Uh, finally, everybody, one sentence, if you can. Uh, your takeaway of the signals coming out of the APEC trade ministers meeting this time. Professor Mahoney. I think they're hedging against an uncertain future with the likelihood of a recession uh, coming out of the United States, which is going to put downward pressure on Chinese economic recovery, which by some accounts is already softening. So I think they're okay. leaving the door to some, so to some negotiation, but I don't see any real concrete positive signs yet. Um, yeah, I mean, 60% of global trade and 50% of foreign direct investment across um, APEC countries is a big stake to be, to be neglected. So I think it's, it's very good for uh, global leaders to, especially the US and, and China, realize this potential to be, to be improved for the better and for greater good for society in Asia and beyond. Well, China and America still need to work with each other. We cannot uh, you know, get rid of each other, but uh, still uh, it's gonna be better for now, but also it's gonna be a worse in the midterm, but eventually in the long okay. term, I believe it's gonna be good. Right. I think the U.S.'s advocacy of the principles of sustainability and inclusion make a lot of sense, but they really need to put these words into actions and overcome the pernicious political um, barriers and uh, you know, counterproductive political uh, initiatives to really bring that economic logic and rationale to achieve okay. those principles. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining our discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's all we have for today. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you here tomorrow. Bye for now.